Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come and to bring our tithes and offerings into the house of God. Father, we thank and praise you that this will go out for the purpose for which it is needed to help support not only this ministry, but to spin the gospel around the world, Father. Father, we thank you and praise you as we give into this offering or any offering that you say that you love a cheerful giver. And it shall be given to you, good made you pressed down and running over. In the name of Jesus, I thank and praise you for that promise. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, I think maybe I'm getting a warped sense of humor. You ever ask what my wife told me? I found a couple of jokes. She said, those are terrible. You can't, you can't be telling those jokes. So I'm going to tell them anyway. <laughs> and you, you all can see that maybe my sense of humor gets a little far out. This is called chocolate peanuts. This is for Pastor Greg. <laughs> That Mrs. Jones had been a staple of her local congregation for many years, and that is why her absence was noticed lately. The pastor decided to drop by her house to check up on her after the Sunday service. He knocked on her door, and being that she's nearly 85, it took her a bit to get to the door. She said, hello, who is it? It's Pastor Greg Smith, she said. Oh, hi, Pastor, come in. How's the ministry doing, she said. Very well, I just wanted to make sure your prayer needs are being met. Oh, honey, I haven't felt well lately, but I'm getting better. Just then the phone rang and she excused herself to get it. The pastor sat there at a table with an old reader's digest and a bowl of peanuts. After 15 minutes and then 20, he heard his stomach growl and began to get restless. He started in on the bowl of peanuts and began reading. After 45 minutes, he suddenly realized that he'd eaten all of the peanuts. <laughs> right then, Mrs. Jones returned and said, Oh, I'm sure sorry. That was my sister from Pittsburgh. She only calls once per month, so when she does, we have to catch up on everything. The pastor, Greg, was feeling a little embarrassed and said, I must also apologize for while you were gone, I got hungry and I ate all the peanuts in your little bowl there. Please forgive me. Mrs. Jones said, oh, that's okay, Pastor. Without my teeth, all I can do is just suck the chocolate off of them anyway. Still not a word. 
They land and the pilot turns to Smitty and said, by golly, I did everything I could think of and to get you to get out, but you didn't. Smitty replied, well, I was going to say something when Martha fell out, but $10 is $10. <laughs> start from Adam and Eve to Abraham to David and all of them. They all 
dysfunctional. Nobody's perfect. We all have problems, but God is always with us. So I would like to speak to you and prophesy over each and every one of you here tonight to tell you that God knows who you are. He knows where you are. And He even knows how many hairs are on your head. Each of you has your own special fingerprint. Nobody in the world has a fingerprint like you, neither before you nor after you. You are special. And God has a plan for you, and He has a plan for your life. And so when He needs you, He'll come to get you. And God's because God has a plan for your life, and the imprint that you are going to make in His kingdom is a special one. Yep. He has a special purpose for you and a special plan. And so you need to be aware of that. God had a plan for Moses' life, and from the very beginning he was saved at the Nile River by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in Pharaoh's house, highly educated in the ways of Egypt, and everything he wanted materially, he had. But, you know, there was that little something inside of him that kept drawing him back to his people. It's that little something inside of us, that thingamajig, you know, that we know in our knower that there is a God out there, and that, that we need Him, I and mean, we can't get <clears throat> by without Him. But you know, like Moses, through circumstances in our lives, or bad decisions that we make, we may end up on the backside of the mountain, or the backside of the desert, with little hope in our lives, doing whatever we need to do to survive. You know, I think we've all been there. I've heard a lot of your testimonies here. I know you've all been on the back side of the mountain wondering where God was and what you were going to do. But God knows how to bring pressure on us to humble us and to bring us to the point that, to really realize that we need Him. If we look over in, in uh, Exodus chapter 2, <clears throat> starting about verse 11, we'll see, see what Moses' problem was. It says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way, and he looked that way, and he looked all around. And when he saw that no one, he thought that no one saw him, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. That's pretty bad, wasn't it? I mean, he decided that he could just take things in his own hand and he could just be the deliverer of his brothers. So then he went the second day and behold, two <coughs> Hebrew men were fighting and he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? And then he said, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptians? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by the well. So you see, through bad decisions and bad action to Moses, he ended up on the backside of the desert for 40 years. And that's another thing that kind of is amazing to me. Moses was 80 years old when God came to him to use him to lead the people out of Israel. That was amazing, one of them. Too high. So that's what we see in these verses is Moses decided his brothers protected, that he could do it his own way, and it got him in trouble. And he'd end up in the meeting on the backside of the desert, tending someone else's flock, and still living in Pharaoh's house with all the perks. So we see in Proverbs chapter 3 that don't be wise in your own eyes. But in the 1970s, I was teaching school in California. Yeah, I was a vocational agriculture teacher. We had a, I was in a small school, school there in, in Calcutta, and, and uh, we, had a, we had a great agriculture department. We had an agriculture farm. We had pens down there to keep, keep our livestock in. And, and when I got there, well, the program was in a real shambles. And 
so I decided, well, you know, I need to see what we can do to help these kids out. And so I can, I remember going down to the bank there in, in Calipatria and talking to the banker and telling him, you know, I've got the ag program to go down here and I'd like to, for the kids to be able to, you know, to be able to uh, buy some livestock and, and to raise them and to compete in the county fair. And, and it's a great teaching tool and and uh, I wonder could we work up uh, some kind of a school loan program, you know, to help these kids out. He said, well, who are you talking about? So I gave him a list of the name of the kid. He said, there's not a chance in the world with that bunch of deadbeats and therefore I wouldn't help them. There's no way I'm going to help them. I'd never get my money back. So I thought, like, man, that's I felt bad when I came out of here. I didn't, I felt real bad. But anyway, I thought, well, I'm not going to give up. So I went to Broadway, the next town up, and I stopped in at the bank in Broadway, and I went in and, and I talked to them, and I told them what I wanted to do. They said, well, we'd love to help you. He said, that's one of our main interests here, is trying to help the FFA kids in their programs and get them started. He said, oh yeah, I'll just send them in, and we'll write them up, and We'll get them going. So, praise God, we did. We, we sent them in, we them up. We had about half a dozen or better steers. We had 15, 20 lambs and a bunch of pigs. And we set up a feed co op and we had a real successful time. And, <clears throat> you know, back in those days, they always sent the, the slow kids to the ag program. You know, if they couldn't make it, and all the, the math and the English and all of that kind of, you know, and social studies or whatever, so any of the kids that were on the bottom end or had some kind of problems, well, they'd send them out to the ag teacher. Well, I don't know, I think there was like maybe 300 kids in the school and I ended up with 90 of them in my ag program. <laughs> One teacher, 90 kids. So, I didn't know what, <laughs> you know, that, that was kind of overwhelming, of course, that I didn't have all at once, most of the time, I was segregated in different, different stages of, during the day, but anyway, part of these kids were what they call in these brown beret, the Mexican kids, you know, they were, had their little gangs going, and they had their little hats that they would wear, and, and uh, you know, they were kind of trouble cocky and troublemakers and whatever, and, and I, so I remember the first day they came into my class, <clears throat> and they were all sitting there talking and whatever, and I said, take your hats off. You're in the school, you're in my, you're in my classroom, and we don't wear hats. So take your hats off. These are our brown and gray hats, and we don't take them off. I said, if you're going to be in this class, you're going to take them off. And if you don't want to take them off, there's the door. And they looked at me kind of funny, because I guess nobody ever talked to them like that before. And so they took their hats off, and from that day off, we had a respectful, uh, <clears throat> you know, I respected them, they respected me, and I had to go and stand up for them a lot, a lot of times, because they weren't always in the wrong. Sometimes the other kids were picking on them too, and you know, and they went on. But anyway, long story short, the Lord showed me how to set up kind of a uh, scoring thing, and I put everybody's name up on, on the bulletin board, and everybody started out with so many points, and if you got out of line or were talking or whatever, or did this or that or the other, well, I'd just go up and mark off so many points. You know, and none of those kids wanted to see that, one of the peers to see them losing points. So. I never had any kind of problem with any of them at all. And most of the kids that were there that <clears throat> had their animals, they, they would go out and get, they had their animals on the farm, and we had the school farm, and so if they would go out and spend so many hours with their animals, and if they did what they were asked to do on the school farm and work in those areas, well, they got points for that. Well, guess what? Most of those kids in my classes had A's and B's. You know, they weren't the bottom, and that gave them some self-esteem and whatever, and so 
long story short, when the kids grazed their animals, we went to the fair, they did very well. I remember in the showmanship classes, they were always pull the top ten, and most of the time they were seven of the cattle put the kids in the top ten, you know, doing the showmanship stuff. But I had this little trick that I used. Whenever you show an animal or a sheep or a steer or a pig or whatever, one of the main things you need to do is keep your eye on the judge. And so I would always walk around with a handful of rocks. And anybody that didn't get, keep their eye on the judge, I'd hit him with a rock. That's a little hard to hit. So I pretty well trained them to keep their eye on the judge. And, and it ended up helping them. You know, I didn't throw a big rock, but just, just to get their attention. But anyway, we had this program going. It was a really a, a, a good program. It was very successful. And my brother-in-law showed up one day, and he had just uh, had gotten an inheritance from a piece of property in Vermont, and he needed to, to invest the money, and there was a uh, dairy farm over in New Hampshire that was for sale that he wanted to buy and he didn't know anything about anything about livestock or any, any of that thing. So he come and approached Ruth and I to come and be his partner. Well, I mean, you know, grew up and my training was in, in, light, in the livestock industry and the animal industry and I spent a lot of time in the feedlot industry and and it was very tempting, and he flew us back there, and it would look really, you know, it was just one of our beautiful farms, and the, at the time that I went back there, and the dew was on it, and the guy went out in the morning, brought the cows in, and milked them, you know, and everything, you know, it was just kind of like every, every young boy or girl's ideal dream for a farm thing, and so I talked to Ruth about it, and. So we decided we'd, we'd go back and try it. See, but that was a problem I had because I was kind of like Moses in those days. I really wasn't walking that close with the Lord. And sometimes I was being wise in my own eyes. To start with, my brother-in-law was an atheist or proclaimed me. He always told me, he said, I'm an atheist, but, but, <laughs> I reserve the right to change my mind in case of emergency. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe me? Oh, well, whatever, I won't get into that. But anyway, that's the kind of guy they were. But anyway, you know, just kind of like around our own flesh, we said, here we were being successful where we were at, and now here's a new adventure and it presented itself, and while we were always. So we. Decided we'd go ahead and I resigned from my job and we went back to New Hampshire to run this dairy farm. Well, the problem was is that the current owner had 15 kids and they did everything by hand. And so when we got back there, I had two kids and they weren't even in high school yet. So that was the number one pitfall that, that we come up against. So. We had to build a new barn, you know, that was more modernized and I could use the tractor to clean it and feed the cows and we built a milk parlor and bottom line is we went we went in debt, you know, to, to do that. And then I found out, you know, in the hard way that the dairy industry and taking care of dairy cows is not quite the same as taking care of some old beef cows. But anyway, <coughs> Ruth and I worked back there for six years, and we had like two days off, I think, in six years, 24-7. But the biggest problem is after six years, <coughs> we were getting ready to go down to the milk parlor in the milk barn one night, and uh, we were waiting for the, the guy to come in to deliver some, some butane, and then have to show him where to put it, and then we were going to go down to the milk parlor, and while the guy was delivering the work, we had one of those, uh, what do you call them? Uh, hmm? I had a microburst came and it knocked the barn down. Right on top of a hundred cows. 
Fortunately, we had what we called a freestyle barn, and there was posts all up, you know. Each cow had their own little stall there, and there was a four by five, four by four post up. And when they heard the big crack, they all ran into those stalls, all but a few of them. And so when the barn came down, it came down and landed on top of the freestalls, and I only ended up out of the whole thing with one injured cow. <clears throat> the rest of them, fortunately, were, were in there, but I had to go in and cut each and every one of them out with a chainsaw and get them out of there. We had no way to get into the milk bar to milk them. And so we did, was in a quiet conundrum and we didn't know what to do. <clears throat> and so we just said, Lord, we need help. We don't know what to do. And I knew this one guy that I, and I called him and told him what had happened, and, and uh, he knew several people around. And so the first thing you know, the, we had several people there to help us. And one of the fellow dairymen who was a friend of ours heard about it. And he called me up and said, Bud, bring your cows over here. You can bring them over here and, and milk them in my parlor until you can decide what to do. And then so, I had, they had to be hauled, he was about 10 miles away, and <clears throat> all of a sudden, this guy shows up with a semi-truck to haul my cows. It was a cattle truck, a semi-truck. He had heard about it. He was over about 40 miles away. It was uh, during the storm, snowstorm, and we had about four feet of snow on the ground. And he went and shoveled that truck out for a hundred yards and brought it over there and hauled all of my cows and worked all night long and would not take one penny. Just, more, just like an angel sent from God. And so anyway, we went over there and, and I milked my cows at the other fellow's dairy for two or three weeks until we could arrange an auction and sale because we had to sell everything out, the barn was locked down and whatever. And so they were over there and I was taking some feed to them and this and that and the other, but uh, you know, I just figured that I would just uh, donate the milk to him for whatever, it, you know, his cost was that was involved for it. And just as a token for helping me out through a tough time. So long story short, after we got everything together and whatever, we had to end up having an auction where we sold all of our machinery, we sold all of our stuff in the dairy barn that was saleable, we sold all of our cows. And <clears throat> so at the end of the auction, the auctioneer came up and gave me a check for $2.42. That was what we had left after everything was paid off. Of course, there was a there was a loan on the barn, and that was still due. And so we called the insurance man to get him to come out. He seemed like a nice guy. He talked to me. He looked all around. Whatever. <clears throat> and he left. And we got a notice back that the insurance company was denying our claim because he claimed that I had knocked the barn down. I had knocked the barn down. It was my fault. And that they weren't going to pay the claim. This was all predicated on the guy that was helping me. He accidentally hit one post in the barn and it was scattered. And you know, there's probably 200 posts in the barn, but this one is. So he looked at that. So I went out and looked at it. I said, you know, Lord, this just cannot be. And it was, when I went and looked at it, it was, you could see where the micro horse had come down and gone up, lifted the roof of the barn, and everything had come, instead of being like it had been knocked down, you know, and spread out, it lifted up and set it right down on the inside. So I, I got a hold of him. I said, you know, you need to come out and look at this. No, we're not coming out. We've already made our decision. So I called the University of New Hampshire. We were about seven miles from them. And I said, would you please send a structural engineer out here to help me because I want him to look at this barn and 
and see what happened to it and why it got knocked down. So they sent a structural engineer out and he looked at it and he said, you're absolutely right. He said the wind knocked that down, not the snow. And so I said, well, will you write me an affidavit of that? So he did and I sent it to him and so the insurance company paid tomorrow. That was another blessing from God. See, when you don't think God is around sometimes, that's when he shows up the most, right? But anyway, we got this all done, all whatever. There we were. I, <clears throat> I was going to, the only thing I knew to do to support my family was to go out and try to find a job. So I went out to try to find a job, and I couldn't really find it. Even about that time, they were, they were building the nuclear, going to start building the nuclear plant down there in Massachusetts for, for the electrical company, and they were hiring to hire about two or three hundred people. So I remember I went down there and I got in line to sign up to, to go to work for the Nurky plant. And I'll never forget to this day, folks. I hope I'm not boring the story. We were down there standing in line and, I, and this guy who was the foreman of the job happened to come walking through and these two young kids, college kids, were standing right in front of me and they happened, their dad knew this guy. And they said, oh, Mr. So-and-so, I'm so-and-so, my dad said if he come down there, maybe he'd give us a job. He pulled them out of the line right then, and they got jobs. I, I looked around at the faces of the other, there were people there that were desperate and needed a job, and I was one of them. And, you know, so we were really not too happy about the personal favor that, that went on for that. But anyway, this, that was not the Lord's plan for me, because... I don't know, there was somebody there that I don't know that knew me. I don't know how they knew me, but they said, you know what, this is probably not your thing. You got to go find something else to do. I said, I wouldn't mind finding something else to do, but I don't know what it would be. But anyway, I went home, and we had brought my daughter a horse, and I wanted to get sell the horse, so I called this old horse trader that I bought the horse from. And I found favor from God from this guy in this horse trip. So he came and he dickered around and, and he finally bought the horse for a couple of hundred dollars less than I'd give. I, he said, I think I gave him five hundred dollars and he wanted to give me three. I said, wait a minute, you just sold me that horse for five hundred dollars, now you want to come back and give me three? What is this with you anyway? That you were telling me what a good horse. Yeah, but he said, that was a while back. Well, it was much that while back. But anyway. anyway, during the conversation, he kind of found out our country and what we wanted to do. And so this guy decided he was going to help. So he knows a guy over in, in Vermont that owns a trailer, a gooseneck trailer, because we had decided then that we wanted to come home. We said, Lord, we want to go home. There's nothing left here in New Hampshire for us. And my brother-in-law and sister-in-law had gotten a divorce and they had split up and the partnership was not going very well. And he had uh, decided that, you know, when we went back there, he'd promised us percentage of the farm and all of that. So all of that after they got the divorce was kind of down the hill. And so we decided we wanted to go home and I was telling this guy, yeah, I think we want to go back to Arizona. So he decided to help me. So he, I, <clears throat> I had hay in the barn, and this was another blessing because another guy that I knew had to had a hay baler. I had all my fields out there that we had 300 acres. And they were all had hay that was ready to cut on and to bale, but I had no machinery equipment to do it, so I had no way to do it. So he came and told me. He said, "I'll tell you what." If you help me, I'll help you. So he said, I'll come and we'll, you can use my equipment, my machinery, and then when I want to be on my hay, well, you can come over and help me. You can help me, you know, haul my hay in and stack it in the barn and, and do all of that sort of thing. And uh, I tell you, he got every ounce of his money out of me too. It didn't make any difference because, you know, that's what we needed to do. So I had the barn full of hay, we had that horse, but we didn't have any other source of income. And then all of a sudden this guy 
shows up in my driveway from the dairy from where we had taken our cows over to be milked until we could, could sell them. And he came over with all his figures and stuff. He said, uh, you know, I just got my milk check and uh, I figured, you know, what I usually get, whatever all, and, and uh, this is your, your part of it. Man, I said, well, well, I said, you know, really, I was just thinking that we would just give that to you for help. He said, oh, no, that's your money. And so he wrote me out a check for $970, which was a real blessing at that time, after one, you only had $2.42. <laughs> so anyway, the Lord provided that. Uh, this guy took me over to, to Vermont. The guy had a had a gooseneck trailer over there and he find, the guy talked him down to it so we could we could buy it with part of that nine hundred and some dollars and he also knew a guy that had a Ford pickup that was set up to pull a gooseneck. So he said, I'll trade you that barn full of hay for that Ford pickup. So that deal. <laughs> so what I want to show you is how God can make a way Right. for you sometimes when there seems to be no way. Amen. 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 I mean, that was the blessing of God because God had a plan for our lives. So he provided all that, brought us back to, to Arizona, put us in a business. We did construction cleanup and stuff for a while and that wasn't going good and then all of a sudden they had this big aflatoxin outbreak here in Arizona where the cotton seed that was feeding the cows had, had the aflatoxin in it. And so <clears throat> they had to figure out what to do with it. Because that's a carcinogenic, they can't feed it to the cows because it'll get it in the milk. Kids drink the milk and then, you know, they can't have any kind of thing like that in the milk. So this guy that uh, was the county agent there, he had thought he had been doing some braids and he found out where he found, saw the pneumonia actually killed aflatoxin. So the question was, we've got all these piles and piles of cotton seed, how are we going to get it so we can seed it up and, and for about two weeks let the ammonia penetrate it and kill the aflatoxin? Well, this other guy from back east just happened to bring that what they call a bagging machine over from Germany. It's a machine that you would feed the front of it and it would press the stuff back into a big plastic bag. We call it a seal feed, you know. It's like your seal meal or whatever. And anyway, these bags would hold about 100 tons at a time. And so they tried it out on my cousin's farm. My cousin called me up and said, Bud, we got this thing going out here. We haven't got anybody to run it. I think you're the guy to run it. Come out here and take a look at it. And in two days, we went from construction cleanup to this uh, aflatoxin business, and it lasted for 17 years, and God bless us for it. Amen. In the meantime, God led us to us. In the meantime, God led us to this good, spirit-filled church in Phoenix. We rededicated our lives, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and we've been serving ever since for 40 years. Amen. See, so God has a plan. God can make a way when he has a plan for you and for your life. So as we read here, we see that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame and a fire in the midst of the bush. And behold, a bush was burning with fire and a bush was not consumed. What this, the fire represented the Shekinah glory of God. That's why the bush was not consumed. The fire was actually the Shekinah glory. It was shining when the glory of God comes and the Shekinah glory, it transforms everything. No, it makes everything better and not to see what it was. And the angel of the Lord was actually the Lord incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ that was speaking to him from the bush. See, and then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight and why the bush does not burn. See, what I'm trying to show you here is God has a way to get your attention, doesn't he? Sometimes he uses different ways to do it, but God has a, a way to get your attention when he begins to want to use you and have you 
has start working his plan for you in your life. So when the, the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. <clears throat> See, so God has his way of talking to you. He, he wants to speak to you. You need, I wonder, are we all so busy in our life sometimes that we don't hear him when he speaks to us? Do we not take time to just turn aside and see what, see what God wants? See, God, God always has a way to get our attention. And when you yield to the call that God has for you, he will begin to speak to you and he'll begin to show you his plan. Just like he did Moses here. See, he, he got Moses' attention. He said, Moses, you're the man I want to use. Now here's my plan. He began to show him his plan in verse 5. He said, and he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. See, that was always an Eastern tradition one to show respect to anybody in honor was to take the shoes off their feet whenever they came into anybody's house to show them respect and honor. So that's what God was asking Moses to do. And he said, Moab, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, so he was afraid to look upon God. You know, there's an intimidation factor when you come face to face with God. I'm always amazed that these people say, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to find out why God did this. Or I'm going to ask the Lord, what, you know, how come he did that? I'm going to tell you something, folks. When you get to heaven, you're going to be on your knees. Right. And you're going to be have the fear of the Lord running all the way through you. And you're going to feel the love of God running all the way through your bones. And you won't care what he did when you were on the earth. <laughs> I'll guarantee you that. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So God knows their sorrows, and this is his intention to come down and begin to get personally involved in it. So I have come down to deliver the them out of the hands of the Egyptians to bring them up from that land to go to a large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Persiaites, the Habitites, and all the otherites. <laughs> now therefore, the cry of the children of Israel have come to me, and have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you might bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And so he has shown Moses his plan. He said, Moses, you're the man that I want to use. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Look at the difference in the attitude here that we saw back over in chapter 2 where he was this young, cocky guy that thought he could do everything through his own strength and his own way. See, God had a way to, he got him on the backside of the mountain, and he humbled him, and now he got him down to the point where he could use him. And I tell you folks, that's one of the most important things that we can remember, is to stay humble. Yep. For God will exalt the humble, but he hates the proud. You could see that he hated Moses when he was proud. He hated what he was doing. He didn't hate Moses, but he hated what he was doing. See, so he brought him back there, and he's humble. A lot of us have been put on the back side of the mountain to be humble, haven't we? We found out that in our own strength and our own way, we can't do it. But through God, all things are possible. Right. See, God Amen. brought us to the point to humble us, to let us to know that we need him. Without him, we're not going to make it all. But with him, we're going to be able to do everything, you know, when he has a plan for life. And he said, I will certainly be with you. 
See, it doesn't make any difference who you are. It makes a difference who God is. When God is with you, you can do whatever He's called you to do. And this shall be a sign to you that you that I have sent you. Watch this. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. He didn't say if you were if you're able to bring them out, did he? He said, maybe if you get them out, then you can serve me. No, he said, when you have... See, he spoke this positive idea into Moses' mind right then. Moses knew that he was going to be able to bring them out because God has said, when you bring them out, this is where you will come. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I had come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to him? How many of you have been in that situation where God has sent you to somebody or sent somebody to you and you didn't know what you were going to say? You know, this is one of the reasons why we see a lot of people who, who won't come to corporate prayer meetings. They either don't care, they're in their places, or they say this is not my thing and, and they don't want to participate. Well, one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people won't come is because they don't know what to say. They don't know what they're going to pray. You know, so this is, I'll show you how you find out what to pray. Because, see, we, as new believers, have the Holy Spirit within us, right? And He can tell us. And He can speak to us. So if we go over to chapter 4, it said, Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eligible. These and four in a sense have you spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Or who makes the, the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have I, have not I the Lord? Therefore go, and I will be with you. I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send me by the hand of whomever else that you may send. So God got mad at him. So he said, The anger of the Lord would kindle against Moses. This was not a bad thing. This was a good thing for Moses. See, God was mad at him because he knew that Moses was capable, but Moses didn't have the, the faith to go do what he called him to do. So God's way of dealing with him was to get mad at him. I mean, when somebody's mad at you, they get your attention, don't they? So God got mad at him, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? Have, I know that he can speak well, and look, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth, and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So you see, God is saying, okay, Moses, you don't have the faith and confidence to go and to be my spokesman, so I'll give you a help. I'll speak to you, you speak to Aaron, he'll speak to the people. So that's what they did for a while, but as you read on through Exodus, you'll finally find that Moses don't do that anymore. He's the one who speaks directly for God. And that is what I want to get into you. God will fill your mouth. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. When God has a plan for you, when He sends somebody your way to minister to, don't be afraid of what you're going to say. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but just have the confidence that when you begin to speak, that God is going to be your mouth. God will fill you in the mouth. He will give you the right words to say, and I'll guarantee you they will be effective, just like I showed you in the beginning when God said, you know, when I need you, I'll come and get you, and he'll send the one to you to get out. When he sent the lady to us who had, whose son had just hung himself, and she's coming for some kind of uh, ministry or some kind of assurance or somebody to, to help us through these bad times. I didn't have any kind of experience in that at all. That wasn't my thing. But 
through love and compassion, so when Bruce and I began to minister to her, God began to show us, to show her that nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not your fault. We all have dysfunction of our family. You know, and they all do things that we don't like to see them do, but nevertheless, it's not your fault. The only thing you're responsible for is to train your children up in the way to go the best you can, but I like to read careful daughter was saying it the other day, he said, turn them over to Jesus and get out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the best thing to do. Now you do a better job of it than, than you can. Okay, so anyway, we see that God has a way to fill your mouth. And then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of God, the Father sent me to you, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am what I am. I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of men, I am has sent you. See, what he was saying is, I am Elohim, the creator of all the universe. I am El Shaddai, the God Almighty, who rules and reigns in my own kingdom. I am Adonai, the Lord and Master of my own kingdom. And I am Jehovah, your covenant-making God. We saw in Genesis chapter 15 where God made a covenant with Abraham, promising him that after 400 years when the people of, of Israel had been burned down in, in Egypt, he would bring them out with great procession and bring them into a land of milk and honey. And now he has chosen Moses to lead the people out and to keep his covenant and his promise. See, God always works through a man. He doesn't do anything on his own. He always works through a man. He works through me. He works for you. He has a plan for you. You have a special anointing. Mm -hmm. You have a special anointing on your life to reach out to help people with oppression. You have a special anointing on your life, Sam, to touch your family and to touch other vets that you come in contact with. Dennis and Jolene have a special anointing on their life to reach out and be God's helpers. God only knows how many people they've helped. And Bobby Padilla has a special anointing on his life to go out and to minister and to evangelize and lead people to the Lord. And now the Lord has put another gift in him, the gift of healing, where he comes and he lays hands on people and we see them healed. Right, Bruce? Bruce shared with me that Bobby prayed for him, laid his hand on a problem that he's had for years for the Lord. is being healed right now. See, so that's the gift. Leonard, Terry, you guys have a special moment. Look at this. I mean, the joy of the Lord is on these people. Yes. I mean, all they are, whenever they're around, there's laughter. Everybody knows where Leonard is because they're just hearing laughter. Right? <laughs> That's a special gift. That's a special gift. And you, my brother, you have a special, you're a special person. I've never met anybody like you before. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I love you. And I know God has a plan for you and you're up here and he has a purpose for you. Amen? David. God has a plan for you, man. I know sometimes you get down and discouraged, but don't. Keep on keeping on. See, that's why God could use Moses. Moses was not only humble, but Moses was and not a quitter. Moses was tenacious. That's why God could use Paul. See, Paul was, I mean, he was tenacious. I mean, he was on fire to make sure that God's ways were done, right? So God knocked him off his horse, taught him through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know that, that Paul spent 14 years on the backside of the desert with the Lord teaching him? 14 years. I mean, you read the, the, the New Testament, it's like he knocked him down one day and the next day he was in Jerusalem preaching. But he wasn't. He was 14 years on the backside 
learning from the Spirit of God taught him everything he knew. He, knew. he did not learn what he knew through other people. He learned it straight from the Lord Jesus Christ. He spent three years ministering with his brethren in Jerusalem, picking up their ways and getting people to know them. But see, God can use you if you're not a quit, if you're tenacious, if you're willing to turn aside when you hear God speak to you, if you're willing to listen and to, when God shows you what to do, when you know what, each and every one of you know what, to, look at Chuck and Marty back there. They spent their 14 years on the back side of the desert. <laughs> God brought them here. And now look what he's doing with them. He had a special plan and purpose for them. They're down in the hospital ministry. That's a, that's a gift. Not everybody can do that. They're with hospice. I don't know if I could stand to be sitting with somebody that all night that I know is going to die the next day. I guess I could if I have to, but that, what a gift. You know, what a gift from God to be able to do that. We all have our gift. Mr. Clark, he's the foundation of this church. He's the pillar of this church. Whenever we need something, we call Clark, at least I do. Hey, Clark, the bathroom is leaking. <laughs> hey, Clark, the electric's out over here, you know, whatever. See, so God has a plan for it. There's Pastor Greg, I love you. Come to my house and sit there and have said a word for six months. <laughs> Finally, his wife said, you know, he is a pastor. <laughs> All the time you have been keeping you straight from then on we weren't picking on you. <laughs> Each and every one of you here, I tell you tonight that God has a plan for your life. Be so deep to hear and do with him for him. And I'd like to wrap it up with this. I have a whole lot more here, but I've been a little bit windy on my own deal. I don't really like to talk to myself about myself, but sometimes I just like to give glory to God because when I reflect back on it, when you're walking through that stuff, sometimes you know, folk, you don't realize what all God's doing. I, we should all keep a journal. I know I should. I don't do it, but I should. You know. So remember, God knows who you are and where you are, and He has a plan for your life. And this is the promise in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. For God says, I know that the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And I speak that to each and every one of you tonight. To let you know that even if you're on the back side of the mountain tending somebody else's sheep, God knows where you are and where you're at. And when he needs you, he's going to come and get you. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank and praise you for being the mighty God that you are. Thank you for everything that you do for us. Lord, give us ears to hear, eyes to see. Help us to be filled to the fullness with your Holy Spirit, to be sensitive to your calling on our lives. Father, we thank you and praise you that when you call us, you'll provide a way. You'll even be our mouth if you have to, to help us accomplish what it is that you want to have done in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.